Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Elliot Abrams and all other things U.S. foreign policy and insanity uh, with Dave DeCamp, who is news editor for the wonderful website I assume you already check out routinely, antiwar.com. Dave DeCamp, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for everything you've been doing at antiwar.com. Uh, Elliot Abrams, uh, remind me and our viewers and listeners uh, exactly what this guy has done with his life. Yeah, so Elliot Abrams is really, you know, kind of one of the worst when you think of, uh, you know, American neocon hawks. You know, the word neocon kind of gets thrown around a lot. And it is kind of fun to use as a pejorative, but it does mean a specific type of conservative. And Elliot Abrams fits the bill. He was part of the Project for a New American Century, the group of neocons that were the architects of the Iraq War. Um, but he got his start really working in government in the Reagan administration in the 1980s. He was in various, uh, served various roles in the State Department. But what he really focused on was Latin America. And, you know, backing these brutal militant groups that turn into death squads in uh, specifically El Salvador and Guatemala. And, you know, the most notorious example there was the El Mozote massacre when the Salvadorian army, a unit trained by the U.S., slaughtered over 800 civilians. And at the time, you know, Abrams downplayed everything. He called the reports about the massacre, said that they were lies. He praised the group as, you know, being very professional. And that was kind of a common theme of what he did throughout the 80s in the Reagan administration. And he was also part of the Iran-Contra, you know, affair uh, scandal and lied to Congress about it. And for that, in 1991, he was actually convicted. Uh, he was supposed to serve two years probation and some community service. But of course, he didn't have to do it because George H.W. Bush pardoned him. And then he was in the George W. Bush administration. Um, there's a I know he's done. A, he did a few things during his time there. He's known as like the one that really pushed for, for the coup against Hamas in Gaza when the Palestinians went to the polls and elected Hamas in 2006. And they, the Bush administration pushed for Fatah, the other group, to kind of try a coup. And it was that fighting that was the justification for the brutal blockade on Gaza that's still in effect today. And then he came back in the Trump administration in 2019 and directed another really brutal policy, which was the failed regime change effort against Venezuela, and you know, which involved crippling, crushing economic sanctions that we know harm you know ordinary civilians much more than the government. And those sanctions are still in effect today for the most part. Biden granted Chevron like a limited license to pump oil, but that's about it. And then Towards the end of the Trump administration, he was appointed to be the Iran envoy as well. And what's interesting is during the last few months, you know, the very hectic uh, transition period when Biden was elected, Abrams led a policy of, you know, they increased sanctions on Iran every week. And the idea was to prevent Biden from being able to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. And it seems like that policy was a success. So now he's a very resilient, you know, swamp creature. And even though being a Republican and being kind of the worst of the worst, Biden just nominated him to head this public diplomacy commission in the State Department, which is a bipartisan commission. It's required to have Republicans. And the good news is hopefully he's not going to be too influential there. They basically analyzed, from how I understand it, analyze U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy, but they do make recommendations and things. So hopefully he's not too influential over there but i mean the the story here is is that despite this track record you know he's still nominated by president biden and i think that should be a huge uh you know scandal really uh it ought to be isn't it a scandal every time this guy gets appointed uh because of his past abuses and offenses and yet he gets appointed and gets a new job uh, repeatedly. But what's with Biden? I, I mean, a guy who, as you say, tries to manipulate and constrain what Biden can do as he's coming into office, uh, who's been convicted uh, of crimes and pardoned by a, a, a Republican president for partisan reasons. Uh, what is what is Biden's stake in picking the worst possible Republican and putting him in? 
Yeah, that's what I don't understand. I mean, there's plenty of Republicans to choose from to put in this position. And I'm sure it's going to get some heat, at least from progressive Democrats in Congress. When Abrams was first appointed by the Trump administration, Ilhan Omar really grilled him about his past, which he defended. And a lot of other people defended him. Uh, but I think it goes to show, you know, that the Biden's foreign policy, especially when it comes to Venezuela and Iran, have been a continuation of Trump's. You know, they don't have any problem with the sanctions, the economic warfare that he waged against these two countries and other countries, of course. You know, the U.S. has just been sanctioned crazy, you know, in the recent years, and Biden's continued that theme. So, yeah, the failed coup in Venezuela, you know, that's all, you know, the Biden administration seems to be all on board with those policies. They probably wouldn't do things as blatantly as Trump did, you know, in, in, in respect to Venezuela. But, you know, I don't think they they have an issue with that. You know, when it comes to Trump's foreign policy, for the most part, they're on board with uh, most things. Do you know whether Congresswoman Omar or any other of the progressive Democrats in Congress have said anything or plan to do anything or to object in the way they did when the very same guy was nominated for something by a Republican president? Um, so I actually haven't seen them say anything, but I might have missed it. I, I, I So I'm not saying that they didn't, um, but I'm ho hopefully that they do have plans. I'm just not sure if they do. Yeah. This uh, this organization that he's been nominated to be part of at the State Department, if you look at the description of it on the State Department website, it looks like a propaganda operation. It doesn't appear to have anything to do with doing diplomacy or, or the public, really, other than manipulating the public through propaganda. But you would think a guy who has been in the back rooms advocating the worst, most hostile, most aggressive, most anti-democratic policies wouldn't be the guy you put on a, a propaganda uh, operation. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, you would think his, you know, past crime, like literal crimes. I mean, he was convicted of lying to Congress and just involved being involved in such a dark part of U.S. history in Latin America, you know, should you know, you wouldn't want want him near anything like that, you would think. So, yeah, it's really tough to figure out, you know, why uh, he was chosen for this. Uh, very, very tough. Um, it will be very interesting to see if there's any resistance uh, from any of the, the better members of Congress uh, in either party. Um, you, you've uh, you've been writing. We were talking earlier, Dave DeCamp, uh, about something slightly more encouraging from somewhere within uh, the U.S. government establishment uh, of something that some some former U.S. officials are doing. Right? Yeah. So uh, there was a report from NBC News that said former U.S. officials have been holding secret talks with Russians with prominent Russian think tankers and academics that are said to be close to Putin. But also there was a meeting uh, between uh, Sergei Lavrov, who's a Russian foreign minister, and several former U.S. officials back in April in New York when he was there for the U.N. Security Council meeting. And the meeting lasted several hours. They said they discussed, you know, potential off diplomatic off ramps and the, uh, you know, what the fate of this Russian controlled Ukrainian territory is going to be. So it's tough to, you know, know if this has affected much, but these former U.S. officials did then brief the White House National Security Council. So what's good to hear about this is that there has been virtually no engagement since Russia invaded last year between the Biden administration and the Russian government and no engagement that we know of, at least on these types of issues. Uh, Blinken, the Secretary of State, has only spoken with Lavrov twice since Russia invaded, which I think goes to show what kind of diplomat he is. And, you know, they didn't they discussed potential prisoner swaps and things like that. Jake Sullivan has engaged more with the Russians, but based on reports, they're talking about, you know, not letting things get out of control, you know, the risk of kind of, you know, de-escalation, deconfliction lines, things like that, but not actually settling this thing and ending this war. Um, so, you know, it, it's good to see, but at the same time, I'm, the Biden administration still just, there's not really any sign that they're going to push for anything like this. You had Blinken gave a speech last month coming out against the ceasefire explicitly and actually like disparaging other countries that have been calling for a ceasefire. 
um, non-aligned countries like, you know, South Africa, Brazil, uh, of course, China has been uh, really calling for that too. And, you know, it's different. It's one thing to be against the ceasefire, but it's another thing to kind of disparage that position. So it's just a really sorry state of affairs when it comes to, you know, the diplomats, so-called diplomats in the Biden administration. But at least some people are talking. And one of the officials, Richard Haas, former State Department official, he wrote recently in Foreign Affairs that the U.S., the West needs a new strategy, has to start thinking about a ceasefire. So, you know, hopefully that that idea is getting more popularity in the Biden administration. Well, I hope people can check out your report, Dave, at antiwar.com and who these officials are and celebrate and encourage and support just talking uh, between these governments. I think there's a the Russian ambassador lives right up the street from the White House in the former embassy where they once snuck Bobby Kennedy in to de-escalate a crisis in Cuba uh, and just sits there. I, the State Department doesn't talk to the Russians, as far as we know, not at uh, not official, currently employed officials. It's, it's happening, mm. if at all, outside of the government, which is, uh, you know, it's encouraging, but it's bizarre that it would have to come to that yeah you're right about the russian ambassador i know he said i think just at the very at very low levels he's talked with u.s officials but nobody's giving him the time of day and yeah it's just i don't know how we got here you know over a year into this war um it's just such a risk with the u.s so involved in this war with russia and no communication you know biden has said that it's the highest risk of nuclear Armageddon since the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember when he said that, I thought, oh, well, maybe that means he's going to kind of try to wind things down. But since then, that hasn't been the case. And you have them pushing for this counteroffensive, even though there's been these Discord leaks and other media reports saying that the they don't think Ukraine can really regain significant territory, but they're still pushing for it anyway, pushing for more, you know, war uh, and no peace talks. That's not that's not what's on the agenda. Didn't President Biden once say that sending fighter jets would mean World War III and say it as if everyone else was an idiot for not understanding that and then later send fighter jets without explanation? Yeah, well, that's the that's the, been the theme. Uh, it's been, you know, saying, oh, we don't want to go too far. We don't want to escalate. We're not going to send them tanks. We're not going to send planes. And then they just eventually do. You know, Biden did say that you know it, he the way he said it was that if american pilots and american uh soldiers went in with the tanks it would mean world war three but uh olaf schultz the german chancellor he said you know he he's been under fire because he's been reluctant to do things but he's been pressured to you know he sent the german made leopard tanks he also signed off on the delivery of mig fighter jets soviet made jets that poland had that originated in germany so he had to sign off on them going to ukraine he defended, you know, in many interviews, he said, I'm trying to prevent World War III and trying to pre prevent nuclear war. That's why we're not taking these steps. And NATO said in the beginning of the war that they were worried Russia would perceive, you know, the U.S. or NATO giving Ukraine fighter jets as the alliance directly entering the war. But all those concerns uh, have gone away, it seems like. And the, the attitude is, oh, well, Putin hasn't used the nuke yet. He hasn't attacked a NATO country yet. So he's probably not going to. Let's keep keep pushing it until uh, see as far as we can go. Meanwhile, we have Russians talking about using nukes as deterrents. If we just use one, then everyone will see what's wrong with them and not use any more than one of them, which is the opposite of what all the war games always mm -hmm. play out, right? Um, but you, you've, Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com, you've been reporting on this war madness in Europe, as well as the buildup to war with China, right? Where, where are things there? Not that, not that we need another war. Yeah. So I've been trying to focus on the China-Taiwan situation. One reason why is because when you hear U.S. military officials or other U.S. officials talk about a future potential conflict over Taiwan, you know, they're talking about fighting a direct war with China, not like a proxy war in Ukraine, but actually fighting, going to war with China. That's what they're planning. Uh, and it's very concerning because, you know, China doesn't have as many nukes as Russia does, but they have a few hundred. They have enough that, you know, a nuclear exchange could, you know, end the world as, as we know it. 
but they're still planning this and what's been happening. And there's kind of a frenzy when it comes to China in Congress. If you see any of these like Senate hearings on China or just the media attitude, it's just like, it's hysteria. And it's not good when a country gets gripped with hysteria. You can see, you know, what happens. You look at the Chinese balloon that ended up over the U S everybody was whipped into a frenzy over that. They used hellfire missiles uh, to, to shoot it down. Um, not hellfire. I forget the air to air missiles. I'm blanking on their name, but anyway, they're, they, they're, they cost $400,000 and then they shot down three more balloons, which were probably little small, you know, research balloons. So you see what hysteria does. So there is this hysteria about China and Nancy Pelosi went over to Taiwan last year when she was the house speaker, which is a sensitive visit because, you know, China is opposed to official government contacts between the U.S. and Taiwan. And China responded by launching its largest ever military exercises and firing missiles over the island and simulating a blockade. And since then, they've kind of kept up the military pressure. They're flying planes closer to Taiwan than ever before. So they're doing all of this in direct response to U U.S. increasing both military and diplomatic support for Taiwan. The U.S. is trying to give Taiwan military aid. They've always sold them weapons since 1979 when the U.S. severed formal relations with Taiwan, but they haven't given them weapons free of charge. But that's all in the works. And China's responding again by putting Taiwan under more military pressure. And then you see in Congress, they say, oh, see, this is why we have to, you know, deterrence is the word. We have to arm Taiwan to the teeth to prevent war when it's really clear. And Chinese officials are saying this explicitly. You know, if the U.S. doesn't back down and just doesn't change course on Taiwan and its overall military buildup in the Asia Pacific, it's going to lead to war. So that's just where we're at. And it's kind of this slow buildup. And, you know, who knows what could happen? There's all sorts of areas of potential flashpoints, the South China Sea. There's tons of U.S. spy planes always flying over there and ships. And they've had close encounters with uh, the Chinese military. So and, and the U.S. just they're putting more bases in the Philippines. So there's just a lot of dangerous areas that say an accident happened. Like in 2001, U.S. Chinese planes collided over the South China Sea. The Chinese pilot died. The American pilot landed in China. If something like that happened now, I mean, with the state of U.S.-China relations, who knows what could happen, what could what it could turn into? Yeah, we, we shouldn't be risking it. And another one of those flashpoints now is apparently Cuba, uh, where Biden has not improved relations. Uh, and uh, I don't know if he caught the Havana syndrome or what, but uh, we <laughs> now we now have talk of a Chinese military base in. Cuba and absolute outrage across the United States at the very idea of one country having a military base in a foreign country. It's just unheard of. Doesn't that have huge potential in terms of antagonizing the U.S. public, which, which actually has very little understanding of the, the U.S. military bases around the world and surrounding China? Yeah. And it's funny because you see these people in Washington say that, you know, China establishing any kind of presence in Cuba is an attack on the U.S., but they say oh, Russia shouldn't worry about you, uh, NATO on its borders. Um, but yeah, so the situation in Cuba, you know, there's been these reports from the Wall Street Journal that came out, you know, right before Blinken was going to China. And one of them said that China and Cuba were working on establishing a Chinese spy base. And from what I understand, China does have some intelligence capabilities left over from the Soviet Union's spy base that they had there, but nothing really that significant. And then there's this other report that they're considering setting up a military training facility. It's all kind of a lot of rumors, and we don't know exactly what the story is, but there's been people, you know, uh, saying, oh, we should invade Cuba now and, you know, take out these Chinese military assets. I know Matt Gates said that, and, you know, it's unfortunate because he's been good on the wars in the Middle East, but for the most part, Republicans are China hawks. But it's just, there's just so many things the U.S. could do, you know, if this is something that they're really concerned about, you know, short of military intervention. You know, Taiwan is just as close to China as Cuba is to Florida, pretty much. Um, and the U.S. recently just sent a few hundred troops there for the and that's the largest U.S. military presence in Taiwan since 1979. And part of the deal between the U.S. and China was that the U.S. would pull its troops out. So there's some bargaining chips. Also, you mentioned sanctions. 
a very easy solution to not letting Cuba be too close to China would be, you know, establishing good relations with them, lifting sanctions. Um, but unfortunately, you know, politically, votes in Miami are so important to the Democrats that they can't do that. Um, so we just have these sanctions, this leftover Cold War policy that just doesn't seem like it's going to be ending anytime soon. Well, some people think that Florida is a lost cause for the Democrats, so they ought to actually do the right thing rather than the, yeah. the thing that caters to votes that don't matter for them. But I don't know. But uh, what about Republicans? Uh, there have been there there have been voices. There has been rhetoric against the war in Ukraine from Republicans, but I haven't seen any action out of members of either party uh, on the war in Ukraine or on the skyrocketing military budget uh where are they well there is some it's i think it's still small but there is a significant opposition in the house among republicans to this war in ukraine but they just don't there's just not enough of them i think is the issue i know they've introduced some bills you know to audit the aid to do this to do that but they don't really get very far and then they had this debt ceiling deal to try to limit spending and it didn't limit military spending. It gave Biden his request for his $886 billion request. And also that deal did not put any limits on emergency spending, which is how they've been spending on the war in Ukraine. So that's what they call supplemental funds. So the White House can request that of Congress and it's not limited by this debt deal. So yeah, there's not really any action to really stop things. And there's been kind of, if you read, you know, the New York Times and stuff, there's all these this this idea that new Ukraine aid might not make it through Congress, but I don't think that's really the case. I don't think the opposition is strong enough. I think they could get more through, you know, once they need it. It, it just seems to me, and I, I've watched the progressive Democrats for years, uh, and these Republicans that are now saying anti-warish things seem very much in line with how the progressive Democrats behave, that they introduce hopeless bills, they make some good speeches or send out some nice tweets, uh, but they don't organize a group of Congress members to vote no unless they get what they want, um, which they're perfectly capable of doing. The Republicans did it before they let the speaker become the speaker. They got some things they wanted. The, the Democrats on the last uh, military spending bill uh, organized and withheld their votes on, until Senator Manchin's oil deal got taken out. But they didn't do that unless the money went down and or or money for a particular war or for any horror got taken out. Uh, and neither are these Republicans, as far as I can tell. They're just it's just rhetoric. Yeah, that's what it seems like, unfortunately. Um, again, I think there are some that are genuine, but there's just not enough of them. And they do have power with this rules committee. So maybe we'll see, hopefully, because I know that there actually is some big name conservative groups um, that are against the spending on the war in Ukraine that are lobbying for that. But they they, they want to focus on China and Taiwan, which is the unfortunate part of it. But so maybe, you know, we might see more of an effort there, hopefully. But yeah, you're right. For the most part now, it has just been nice rhetoric that gets people, you know, because if you look at polling, Republican voters are, are uh, it's been growing that they're against the funding the war in Ukraine. So that's why you had, you know, uh, McCarthy before the election say, oh, we're not going to write a blank check for Ukraine. So it was all about the vote. He's been one of the staunchest supporters of all this and he'd been going after Biden for not sending, you know, enough weapons. So that was very clearly just to get, you know, the votes. Isn't isn't it sort of a pattern that around this point, a year and a half or so into a war where everybody breaks out their flags and tears at the start of it, they get tired of it and they stop believing that it's about to be won by next Tuesday and it's a noble cause. And, and, and it's not so much that they become wise opponents of militarism as that people just get tired of it and start noticing that the, the infrastructure is falling apart and there's no funding for anything other than the, the, the war that appears endless. Are our polls going to shift? Are we going to have people uh, start opposing this war as they have so many others uh, at about this, this point? Yeah, I think so. I think it's kind of been going that way as this thing drags out. And like you said, as infrastructure is crumbling and 
people are dealing with their own problems and you look at the price tag. I mean, it's $113 billion that they've approved to spend on this war so far. I mean, it's just such a crazy amount of money. So yeah, I think that's what we need is more just people to, to be against this, this policy. We've, uh, we've just got a few minutes left, Dave, to camp. What are you, what stories are you looking into? What can we expect uh, to see at, at antiwar.com in the coming weeks? Well, I think a big one is the Vilnius summit in, in the NATO summit next week that's going to be held July 11th and 12th. There's all this talk about they want to give Ukraine new security guarantees and Ukraine wants a pathway to membership. And we know, you know, this is all very provocative to Russia and Russia's kind of main uh, demand during the very short lived negotiations at the beginning of the war was Ukrainian neutrality. So any kind of new promises when it comes to their NATO membership is just going to kind of give Russia, you know, the reason to keep the war going. So we're not sure, you know, what what exactly they're going to get. Some people are calling for the Israel model, which means, you know, sign a 10-year deal that says you get X amount of military aid each year, but you don't get, a, you know, a mutual defense guarantee like, like a full NATO member does. So, yeah, we'll probably see something like that. I think it could be a pretty pivotal summit, similar to the 2008 Bucharest summit when Ukraine was first promised that they would eventually become a NATO member. But it's never, you know, they were, they've never been given a timeline or anything or a date. And that's what they want. I don't think they're going to get that, but they're going to get something. It seems like. Yeah, um, I, 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 I wanted to ask you before we run out of time. I, I'm looking at the New York Times and their take on any Republicans, Republican presidential candidates that say anything against the war, and they're all denounced by the New York Times as isolationist. That is, if you're not for bombing everybody you're for rudely ignoring them and who wants to be rude and we must engage with the world but then when they quote what these people these are horrible people i have no sympathy for trump uh DeSantis, uh all various republicans they all say let's end the war let's let's impose this peace agreement let's uh you know get out of there uh it, it, none of it is isolationist what what is with that that insult yeah, well, I think it goes to show just how involved the U.S. is everywhere that if you oppose one specific intervention, then you're an isolationist. But that's been a smear. You know, that's what they always call people that are against war, even though, you know, they're pro, you know, diplomacy and international engagement and international business. Um, but for those guys, for Trump and DeSantis, again, it's kind of the prior. They don't they want to prioritize their interventions. They think Ukraine is taking too much from you know, Taiwan. And there's a really influential guy named Elbridge Colby, who was in the Trump administration in the Pentagon. And he's a super China hawk. And his whole thing is, you know, tone down support for Ukraine to increase support for Taiwan. And there's this big write up about him in Politico. And they described him as like a non interventionist. Right. <laughs> and this guy is saying the US has to commit to going to war with China over Taiwan. I mean, it's just like, you know, it just goes to show kind of the dire straits, I think that we're in. Well, they don't want to insult people for wanting the wrong war because they like wars too. They want to yeah, exactly. they want to call them some other nasty name. Uh, I wish we could go on. We've been talking with Dave DeCamp. He is news editor for antiwar.com. Go there if you don't regularly go there already and check it out. Dave, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.